Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Well, one of the most impressive guys that I've met in Toronto uh, is Jay Rosenzweig, who runs his own company that's in the recruiting business. He's also very involved in human rights, very involved uh, politically. He's an activist, and he's invested in a bunch of fascinating companies. And so it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce you to him all tonight and, uh, and to chat with him a little bit about life and about his business and about what he thinks about what's going on. Uh, Jay Rosenzweig, thanks for joining us. How are you? My pleasure. Doing great. Good to see you, Brian. Good to see you. So uh, let's start with uh, sort of an overview. You run your own recruiting company. Uh, it's the Rosenzweig uh, Company. How did you get into the recruiting business? And I understand it's like been like 20 years. It's been a while. Yeah. So uh, just by way of background, I'm born and raised in Montreal and studied at McGill for seven years straight. I did a BA in uh, philosophy and and then uh, did two law degrees and met a really important mentor, Erwin Kotler, uh, which touches on some of my human rights work, which I'm happy to get into. And ultimately, upon graduation, I ended up um, working at a law firm in Toronto that very prominently represented people who were wrongfully convicted. They did a lot of the cases such as Guy Pomeray and Milgard, et cetera. And um, ultimately, I pivoted into the uh, world of talent strategy totally by fluke. My wife had seen an ad in the newspaper in those days the career section would be actually a physical paper. And um, before the, LinkedIn, uh, then indeed. Exactly. The, the, uh, the, the article read, looking for a director of business affairs for a large entertainment corporation, looking for a lawyer with 12 years experience, if interested, applied to the following recruiting firm. Now, uh, I didn't have nearly 12 years of experience and I didn't know much about recruiters, um, but I decided to apply for that job figuring that recruiters find people jobs. Um, so hopefully I could hustle my way in, talk to someone there. Anyway, long story short, someone calls from the recruiting firm and says to me, um, you know, you're way underqualified for the job that you applied for. It was IMAX, by the way. Um, uh, but you seem to have a really interesting background. Tell me about yourself. And I did. And they said, well, you know what? You have a good way about you on the phone. Uh, we're actually looking for someone to work here as an associate, would you be interested in applying? <laughs> <laughs> so at first I thought, what am I going to be a headhunter for? I just became a lawyer uh, pretty recently. Uh, but the more research I did into the industry and the high end of the industry, the more I realized that it's kind of a cool little niche. And uh, I saw that the backgrounds of uh, all the partners were so incredibly impressive that I decided to take, take a shot. They hired me and two decades later, I'm still in the business. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. So tell us, um, what do you think of the current uh, market for, uh, for your talent, uh, um, you know, management, uh, uh, acquisition, uh, recruiting, et cetera. Lots of people are saying that uh, the market's changed dramatically after COVID, that, uh, you know, there's been articles about the great resignation. There's been articles about the gig economy, uh, that people uh, aren't staying in CO jobs or top uh, C-suite jobs nearly as long. Um, what's the market for your business today? Well, the landscape has definitely changed quite a bit. Um, there's definitely a, a, a push towards a different kind of approach to uh, the workplace. And uh, I, I don't think it's ever going to come back. Even if uh, one day, please God, the whole COVID thing goes away. Um, uh, I, I do think that moving forward, there, there will be a hybrid model regardless. Um, and, uh, you know, people don't really stay in jobs as long as they, they used to. Um, so now if you, if you're able to have like a three-year run with a really great employee who's, who's helped take the business to another level, you're pretty happy. You, you don't need to really assess resumes in terms of, well, if this individual has a number of jumps in their background, we shouldn't look at them. It's just a different kind of approach. The other thing I'd say is um, it's important in my business and I think in general to go where the, uh, the puck is, is going to be, let's say, over the next two, three years. And one of the areas that I focused a lot on uh, over the last year or two is the Web3 space, which is a really exciting place to be. Um, and it's been really fruitful for me from an investment point of view, as well as talent strategy. Please, please explain to us what the Web3 space is. Right. So Web 1 was kind of late 90s when we were uh, looking at the Internet or what they called, I guess, at the time, the information superhighway. 
Um, and people were kind of skeptical at the time as to whether or not the, uh, the internet <laughs> would really be much of a big deal, uh, other than being like a cool place to find some information. And obviously uh, it's been proven to be a real, really, really big deal, but only a couple of companies have really come out of that time, such as Amazon and eBay. But um, uh, over the years, um, Web2 then emerged, and that's more the social media world, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters of the world. Um, and now we're on to a new phase called Web3, uh, which includes the metaverse and the NFT space. Um, and it's a very community-oriented kind of bottom-up approach, which is uh, going to be really transformational uh, into the future. Um, the artists have been experiencing quite a renaissance, as an example, uh, through the NFT space. I don't know if you've been following it much, but it's become a multi, multi-billion dollar company with no, multi-multi-billion uh, dollar sector, rather, with no end in sight. And you're doing this from an investment standpoint or from a recruiting standpoint or both? Both. Both. Um, so uh, there's a company called CryptoSlam as an example, which I got really uh, fortunate to, to invest in really quite early alongside Mark Cuban and, and Ashton Kutcher. Um, and it's become kind of the Bloomberg of the NFT space, um, which basically provides all kinds of data and information, real-time pricing at, of, of NFTs. And um, we were able to get in really, really early. And as soon as we invested, uh, they came back to us to ask us to do um, a, a chief technology officer search, which was a fantastic um, win for us, almost covered our, our original investment. And then we ended up placing a VP engineer for them. And um, they're on the verge of uh, another big round with some major uh, venture capital firms behind it. And uh, so it's been a great investment for me on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's um, it's helped me in the bucket of my day job, namely the town strategy work. Fantastic. Well, we'll have to take a break for some messages and come back and ask yeah. you to explain what an NFT is because not everyone understands what an NFT is. Anyway, we're chatting Happy with uh, Joe Rosenzweig today, who uh, is a recruiter, um, a talent acquisition uh, expert, uh, a really nice guy, uh, someone that's involved in uh, human rights issues, someone who's an investor in the in the tech space, Web3, as he's uh, described it. We're going to take a break for some messages and be, uh, be back more with Jay in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real pleasure of mine tonight to be chatting with uh, Really one of the most impressive guys that I've met in uh, Toronto. He's uh, someone who I've uh, interacted with in uh, politics and business and socially over the last couple of years. And, uh, and this is a guy that uh, knows what's going on, um, has a uh, pulse on uh, politics, on uh, some of the, the major issues that our, our country and our, and our world are uh, faced with. He's been very involved in some human rights issues and uh, has invited me to some events in that regard. Uh, and he's, um, he's, uh, really knowledgeable what's happening with markets um, uh, because he's out there recruiting people. Let me just read you a little bit about Jay Rosenzweig, who is the founding partner of Rosenzweig and Company. He's an expert in designing, building, and attracting world-class teams. He consults to public and private companies, including large global corporations, emerging growth to mid-sized businesses, professional services firms, and private equity and venture capital firms. Prior to joining the search industry, Jay was in the field of law. He earned three degrees at McGill University, philosophy, civil law, and common law. In addition, he completed the Harvard Law School negotiation program taught by expert negotiator Robert Fisher, author of Getting to Yes. Jay has immersed himself in global human rights causes for well over two decades. He's an active board member of Erwin Kotler's Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and has been internationally recognized for the annual Rosenweg Quality Report on Equality, which he has published for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, and he's also invested in some businesses, and we're going to come back to that um, in, uh, in our next segment. Um, and finally, I didn't know this about you. You're an avid songwriter, having collaborated with well-known recording artists and written original music for each member of your family. Awesome. Songwriter. Fantastic. I didn't, I doubt you knew that I was the lead singer of a punk rock band at one point in time. <laughs> I love that. I'd love to see the footage. We've By got the way, some. Go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. You might remember um, my son's bar mitzvah. I sang to him. I do I remember that. The, the YouTube of it. Yeah. 
It was yeah. pretty spectacular. Those anyway, great, uh, great memories. Jay, we were talking about NFTs just before the break. Can you tell us what an NFT is, please? So essentially, it's um, it's a technology that's enabled by the blockchain, which is like a public uh, kind of ledger, if you will, uh, a public record that's immutable. Um, so I mentioned artists uh, previously and how this is helping artists experience really a, a rejuvenation or a renaissance in a lot of ways. My daughter, Ali, for example, is, uh, is a painter, super talented painter, and she's been um, selling some of her art and she's been doing some commissioned work, etc. So picture Ali, who's not well known right now, um, selling a painting for $500 or $1,000 or $2,000. If one day she were to become really well known um, and, and a really well respected uh, artist on a, on a grand scale, it's possible that uh, her, that original painting may go in the secondary and third market for a million dollars. Um, Ali would never be able to benefit from that um, appreciation um, with physical art. If it were to be minted as an NFT on the blockchain, then um, there are these smart contracts, uh, is what it's called, which are cooked into or baked into the technology, where she could, as an example, as part of the contract, say, I get 20% on any sale that's made into the future um, so that she's able to share in the, uh, in the proceeds of ongoing sales of her art. Um, another application as an example. Sorry, let me, let me interrupt you for a second. Of the physical piece of art or of the digital reproduction of the piece of art? It would be the, uh, the, digital, the, the digital reproduction of the, of the piece of art. But you could also mint the, um, the IP rights to the physical as well. Um, so in the future, um, I believe, for example, tickets to all events will end up being NFTs and you could bake in all kinds of utility and perks uh, to those tickets. So, um, you know, a year ago or so, maybe six months ago, there was a reunion, which is, which is big for kids in hip hop, of Drake and Kanye West who had some sort of feud. Um, if you were to mint the ticket of when Drake and Kanye West got back together, which you would use to go to the event, but then decided to sell it um, in the open market 10 years from now, theoretically, that would be a tremendous collector's item, which can then in turn be sold again and again and again. Um, there's a very big um, uh, NFT figure who kids love, he's, he's very inspirational, he's motivational, his name is Gary Vaynerchuk, he's got 10 million followers on Instagram. So he did, a, he did an NFT series called VFriends, which are basically his doodles, um, which are not particularly sophisticated doodles, his doodles of various animals. So he'd do um, phenomenal fly, um, happy hip, hippopotamus, and each of these doodles he minted as an NFT, um, but provided in the smart contract for each of these NFTs, what you call utility. So if you buy this um, NFT, you get to have a Zoom call with Gary every month where he can offer you career and life advice. For this NFT, you would uh, be able to purchase, um, uh, you have the opportunity to sit courtside with Gary at a Knicks game and so on and so forth. His project within three months, gross sales of like $90 million, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? Yeah, a few of his pieces were sold at Christie's, um, you know, one for like $400,000, another one for 250, like, and he's now uh, released a series of 55,000 NFTs called um, uh, uh, VFriends 2. But what I was gonna say is, it could apply to the music industry as an example. As I understand in the music business, um, if you sign with a record label, essentially the record label will get 80% of the revenue from your songs, you get 20. In this case, you can mint a song as an NFT, 
have the people who believe in you uh, as, an, as an up and coming artist vie into the NFT series of your music and you end up making 80% so it flips the other way and sharing the 20% with those who believed in you and invested in you early, early on versus what they might call sharing with the corporate greedy ones. So it's, it's, a whole new, it's a whole new thing. It's gonna get bigger and bigger. The whole NFT Web3 space will be one that eventually everyone will adopt. It's just very, very early days. It's just as big as Web1 and Web2 as I described. So it's interesting. Um, you probably heard the news that Warren Buffett uh, had the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting this past weekend, yeah. and uh, the first one in uh, in I guess a couple of years, given COVID nineteen. And both him and uh, and and his number two guy both spoke very negatively about blockchain and Bitcoin, and said that it was effectively worthless and that uh, it, it wasn't going to amount to anything. Uh, and uh, and actually, Warren Munger. Um, is it Warren Munger or Wayne Munger? I can never remember. Um, had some extremely negative things to say about uh, about blockchain and Bitcoin. Where does NFT differ from blockchain and Bitcoin? Well, NFTs, as I as I was describing, um, it's more about the utility. It's not a um, it's not a uh, currency, right? Uh, it's a non fungible token which has uh, a specific kind of utility or you could buy into an NFT because you like the underlying art. Um, the blockchain itself is something that's highly secure and immutable and a good way to protect intellectual property. So it's very different from, let's say, a, a coin which is being used as a, a specific asset or, or currency. Um, that gets into a whole bunch of other issues related to banking and and the like, which I'm sure um, you know conservative investors such as uh, Warren Buffett would have a big problem with. But the blockchain itself, it's undeniable that it's a it's a fantastic tool, and the NFTs sit on this blockchain. Fascinating. And yeah. so uh, this is one of the uh, companies that you've invested in, and we'll come back to some of the other ones. Uh... Uh, in the future, tell me a little bit about um, your equality uh, um, series. So that uh, this is something you've been doing, I understand, for 17 years, and it's about uh, um, sexual equality, women's equality. Um, how did you get into that business? Yeah. So as I mentioned uh, in law school, I, I, I became very close with um, a professor named Erwin Kotler, who who many know, and 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 I know that you're 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 well aware of Erwin. Um, and worked for him summers, and uh, we just grew very close uh, up until this day. We're, 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 uh, we're really great friends, and he inspired a lot of the work that I do. He represented people like Nelson Mandela back in the day and Natan Sharansky, and of course was uh, Canada's Attorney General and Minister of Justice, where he enacted all kinds of progressive laws, um, including the Marriage Equality Act. Canada may have been the first country to do that, um, and Erwin, uh, Erwin championed that law, freed more people who were wrongfully convicted in one year, more than any of the previous ministers combined. Um, and if you fast forward to today, I chair his International Human Rights Board, as you mentioned, the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Um, but when he was in parliament, he was actually the first man on the Women's Caucus. Um, and first man also, on the Women's Caucus. On the Women's Caucus. And he always tells me, that his most valuable uh, meeting on a weekly basis was the meeting of the Women's Caucus. It was him and a bunch of, uh, of women uh, in parliament. And um, he found those meetings to be particularly nuanced and, and, and really, really stimulating and productive. The other thing he did was he transformed our Supreme Court into the most gender representative in the world at the time. And these things really inspired me. I started my own firm in 2004. Um, and around 2006, inspired by Irwin's work and also um, uh, inspired in a way, but almost in a negative way, by an um, advertising executive who came into Toronto from the UK and made a speech. And in part, as part of his speech, he indicated that he thought women didn't really make it to the top in big numbers because they didn't have what it takes. They didn't have the toughness. 
And um, he was sent home pretty quickly, but it also got me thinking about, you know, what's the status of women in corporate Canada? And as you know, um, according to the regulations, public companies must disclose the compensation of their chief executive officer, their chief financial officer, and give or take the next three uh, top jobs uh, in a corporation. So essentially the 500, what I decided to do is explore the top 500 roles in Canada, the 100 largest publicly traded companies, and how many of their top people were women, what percentage. Um, so it's 2006, I thought the numbers would be low. I didn't realize they'd be that low. We determined that year that uh, the percentage was 4.6%. And I determined that um, I would put a mirror to corporate Canada on a yearly basis um, after having uh, seen that low number and um, work on this project until hopefully one day I work my way out of a job. 17 years later, I haven't yet worked my way out of a job. The what's good the, news is- What's the 4.6% the, up to? Yeah, so the good news is the, um, the numbers have doubled. The bad news is we're still under 10%. So we're like nine point something. 10% or of the yeah. top 500 jobs in corporate Canada, publicly traded companies, 100 largest companies, less than 10% are held by females. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And if you look at the CEO role, uh, the numbers are even, even worse. Basically, so I had a, basically I had, the same two or three women for the last I, 70 years. Yeah. I had a really interesting uh, discussion this past weekend with, uh, with someone about the difference between affirmative action and quotas. And, um, and, and, and the argument was uh, comparable to you know, the statistics that you're talking about is that uh, female representation in politics, in, uh, in boards, in uh, corporate Canada isn't high enough. And so therefore we should have either quotas or affirmative action. Um, and one of the parties uh, that was arguing was arguing quotas are wrong because unqualified people can end up getting jobs, but affirmative action is helpful. Uh, and the other person said, no, even with affirmative action, which we've done for a long period of time, we never get to the, the numbers we need. And so we need to have quotas. And it was good enough for Trudeau in 2015 to uh, say 50% of the cabinet had to be female. So why isn't it good enough for boards and, uh, and management teams? What do you think? Affirmative action or quotas or both? Um, I, I've always uh, shied away from both. Um, uh, certainly... There are a lot of uh, downsides, particularly to quotas. Um, years ago, Norway uh, mandated that at least 30% of uh, women had to be uh, on boards and, and, and in top jobs of uh, large corporations, publicly traded corporations. And um, what happened was a lot of um, companies delisted out of Norway and went elsewhere, <laughs> just as an example. Um, a lot of women complained that um, they don't want to be looked at as a quota when they're sitting or suspiciously potentially as they're uh, sitting around the board table. Um, so we need to tr treat the, the concepts of affirmative action and quotas really carefully. Um, but it's, it's gotten to the point like 17 years that I feel that um, the issue needs to be forced a little bit. Um, so Given all the body of work that I've been involved in, I do think that um, uh, it would be appropriate to force the issue a little bit more, maybe mandate uh, quotas. Maybe it's not 30%, but push the issue a little bit more because the, the speed has been so glacial up until now. I just wonder like, if we just keep at this rate, like, you know, what will the status be 10 years ago, 10 years from now rather? Um, I don't know if the numbers will be much better, sadly. With quotas, you know, arguably uh, you set the quota at 30 or 50 or whatever that uh, percentile number is, and, and you've got to uh, meet that quota. And so you put in place whoever you can find that ends up being uh, hopefully qualified for the position. With affirmative yeah, well, action. I, well, I should jump in for one sec. I do think that there are plenty of uh, qualified women at the VP level such that uh, VP and SVP level, such that there'll be plenty of qualified individuals. But you were saying about affirmative action. Well, and, and I guess yeah. this is my point. With affirmative action, what you would be doing is you would be saying, 
um, I want to do those things that uh, are the smart things to do to ensure that those VPs and SVPs get the mentoring, get the education, get the experience, right. get the contacts, get the networking benefits such that in the future they'll be uh, considered for those positions. So I'm not forcing them into those positions, but I'm helping them into those positions. Isn't so, affirmative action um, a, a better solution than quotas? I think so. I mean, that, that the, the quotas would be the extreme the extreme solution. Um, and uh, what I could tell you is I've been pushing for a path towards affirm affirmative action, which would be seamless. Three years ago, I was at a uh, I was at an event for a wonderful organization called Move the Dial, designed to elevate women in, in the tech space. And Katie Taylor, who is currently the chair of uh, Royal Bank, former CEO um, of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts uh, for a number of years, and uh, she's contributed to my report. She's provided a quote uh, in support of my report and endorsement. So she came up to me that night and she said, you know, Jay, I have a bone to pick with you. I love the report you do. It's, it's fantastic work, but I've got a bone to pick with you. I'm like, what is that? She says, have a seat. Let's sit down and talk. So something I alluded to earlier is the fact that women are finding it even more challenging beyond the senior executive roles to get to uh, CEO. And she said, I'm willing to bet if you look at your statistics, you will find that even though the, number are, the numbers are so low, they're even lower if you assess which of those women are running business lines. And sure enough, she was right. Um, a very, very small percentage of that small percentage of women were running business lines. They were running really important functions such as the CFO role and the marketing role and the HR but very few were running um, business lines. And that meant when it came time for the boards to promote to CEO, the ones that weren't running businesses were immediately disqualified. So her view, and we ended up writing a, a column um, in, in the Globe and Mail on that, is to mentor and encourage women to ensure at a certain point in their career that they put their hands up and, um, and, and volunteer and push for opportunities to run businesses. And that includes mentorship programs and the like, which according to the definition that you're providing, um, really, really falls under the zone of affirm affirmative action. We're chatting with Joy, Jay Rosenzweig, who is the uh, um, head of a recruiting company by the name of Rosenzweig and Company. He's uh, very involved in uh, human rights. He's involved uh, in, uh, in publishing an annual survey on equality. He's an uh, investor in a bunch of different technology companies, and he knows a lot about uh, hiring and uh, recruiting of individuals. We're going to take a break and come back with Jay in just two minutes, and we're going to ask him a little bit more about you know, the right way to get a job in today's marketplace. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. Pleasure of mine to be chatting with Jay Rosenzweig, who is uh, head of the Rosenzweig and Company, Inc. Um, his uh, tagline is building the leadership teams of tomorrow, taking responsibility for our world today. Sounds pretty impressive, uh, Jay. Um, and I just wanted to uh, to tell everyone a little bit about uh, um, about uh, Jay. I've uh, given you an overview of his uh, resume um, his uh, 20 years as uh, the founding partner of Rosenzweig and uh, company, an expert in designing, building, and attracting world-class teams. I told you about his three degrees from uh, McGill University. I've told you a little bit about his uh, human rights uh, um, involvement, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. But I also want to tell you about some of the companies that he's invested in. He invests and advises several leading-edge businesses, most of them based in California, New York, and Ontario, including, get this, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, the next quantum step in transportation. Winston House, a global community of young creators sharing a passion for people, music, art, sports, travel, brands, and activism. Drop the leading millennial coalition loyalty program. 
Cover US, which empowers people to harness the power of their personal data to earn money and save on health costs. The Knowledge Society, TKS, the next level in education, developing young people to solve the world's biggest problems using emerging technologies. And Helio, the next big idea club comprising the world's most brilliant minds, handpicking the ideas that will change your life. Pretty impressive. I actually interviewed, um, I think about uh, five people, five students from the Knowledge Society, TKS, Really impressive uh, kids, and uh, and they really were uh, interested in changing the world. Uh, and it was a program for you know kids in high school. I was uh, very impressed with them. Um, let's uh, come back to some of these companies in just a second. Uh, so the main business that you're involved in is Rosenzweig and Company, uh, um, which is a recruiter company. Lots of people, um, they say, I don't know whether this is true or not, and I'd be interested in your point of view are sort of giving thought to their life uh, through COVID. Uh, you know, some people have said it's been a timeout, a global timeout where we all had to go to our room and, uh, and take some time to think about life. And uh, they've been thinking about what's important. And, and so therefore, you know, we've had Forbes uh, issuing a major uh, article uh, on the, the great resignation and saying lots of people were leaving corporate world. Uh, I, I, met, uh, I met some people from WeWork so today and they said that uh, demand for, for this temporary workspace is an all-time high as uh, people want to start their own businesses and, and the gig economy is, is growing like crazy. Um, if you were advising people today in how best to think through what the next step in their career is doing, which you must do on a day in and day basis, uh, and in getting jobs, what do you tell them? Is it you know just polish up your resume? Is it uh, go to a psychiatrist and think about the future? Is it put your stuff on LinkedIn and Indeed, or is it hire Jay to help you out? Um, it's it's a really great question. Uh, I, I try to look at it in a, a more holistic way, if, if I can, um, and suggest to young people, first of all, not to be pressured to uh, chase what everyone else is chasing and to, um, you know, entrepreneurship is becoming uh, a pretty hot thing. Like the entrepreneurs of today are kind of today's rock stars in, in a lot of cases. I find uh, young people are looking up to entrepreneurs more and more. Um, but you kind of have to look deep within and, and determine for yourself really what makes you happy. And um, there's no one size fits all for that. Um, some might be happy with a nine to five job and being available for their uh, family and being the, the coach of their kids baseball club. Um, others might find that um, the entrepreneurial route is, is what's most important to them and uh, that they're prepared to put in the 100 hours a week and endure all the stress because they thrive off the excitement of that kind of opportunity and making a lot of money is, is big for them. So I think it really depends on um, what's really uh, important to a, a particular individual more so than, um, than chasing perhaps even their parents' concept of what's important, um, namely stability and things of that nature. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite liberal in approaching um, uh, advice to kids to really pursue what makes them ultimately most happy. I spoke last week with uh, someone who describes himself as a mid-career coach, and she said she's never met as many people at one time that mid-career, so I presume that's you know 40s and 50s, that are frustrated with their corporate lives and are rethinking things. So, so this advice, is it the same for people mid-career as it is for young people, or is it different? Well, I think um, the example of individuals who are mid-career is um, a perfect warning for uh, kids who are about to embark upon a career, or even post-high school, um, embarking on whether or not to go to university or not, and what they should be studying, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you can point to these individuals who are having that mid-career, let's say, crisis uh, when, when coaching kids and say, you know, you, know, you don't want to be there. Um, very likely, uh, a lot of these individuals um, sort of follow the path of least resistance and the acceptable, the quote-unquote acceptable path, and woke up one day realizing it's not really what they wanted to be doing. Um, in terms of coaching uh, 40s and 50-year-olds mid-career, I'd say, look, if they're healthy, uh, again, pursue what makes them happy. If they need to make 
uh, you know, a really big change in their life to do something that they've always dreamed of doing, then uh, then they should go for it. And and there are ways practically to uh, work on making that happen. Like, you know, with with all of the uh, uh, knowledge we have in in terms of health and, and nutrition and all the rest of it, all things being equal, you know, people can have careers well into uh, their 70s and 80s and beyond. Uh, I'm really optimistic about the future from that point of view. So I know, interviewed uh, Jimmy Patterson two weeks ago, 93 years old, still works every day. There you go. Um, so if you're 40 years old and you realize that, uh, you know, you're in a corporate job that's not interesting to you and and uh, that you really don't enjoy and you know your passion is elsewhere whatever it might be then i'd say go for it you know you're still you're still young and you have you have a lot of your life ahead of you what about just actually getting a job if someone just wants to get a job what's the way today i heard that something like 80 percent of all jobs are filled on uh, linkedin and indeed is that uh, is that the truth i i would say um if you have a particular passion, research the companies that are doing or, or are in a space that it's of real interest to you and um, research each of the companies in that category really deeply. Don't worry about whether or not there's actually a job opening at that company or not and find ways, especially when you're younger, because when you're younger, you're freer in a lot of ways um, and research the founders, research the problems that this uh, business is facing, the stage it's at, and reach out cold to each and every one of these companies and offer how you can help them. And uh, again, the younger you are, the more you might uh, be apt to offer to work for a company like that for free um, in order to get onto the right path or to intern for the CEO, to learn and get into a business and sector that's of real passion to you. Um, looking on LinkedIn and Indeed and all the rest of it, um, you'll probably only uncover jobs that um, are close to, if you're lucky, um, the kinds of things that you really are passionate about and you want to do. I'm more, um, I'm more inclined to um, uh, advise young people to just chase the sectors and, and the companies that they specifically are passionate about and dream of working at. And do you, uh, you always work for the, the companies or do you work for individuals? So my, my business uh, is in advising uh, companies on talent strategy and, and uh, team building and, and bringing on executives for very specific roles. I don't represent individuals. However, from time to time, I'm always happy to help a friend uh, if I can um, to approach companies that uh, they might be interested in. But that's not for financial reasons. It's just given some of the connections I have from time to time, I've helped individuals. And when you say that people should reach out and contact uh, companies and founders cold, how do you recommend that? Do you email or telephone or walk into their office or, or connect uh, with them on uh, LinkedIn yeah. or what? Well, if you, could find, um, if you can find the appropriate emails, I think email is good. Um, luckily with social uh, media, um, you can find almost anybody you're able to yeah you can find almost anybody you can direct message them on linkedin um or even uh, some of the other uh the other uh, social media platforms depending on the vibe and depending on the kind of business these individuals are in like it's not inappropriate in some cases to dm someone on instagram um and you'd be surprised if you're tenacious enough um you'll get in with certain companies, even if it means, like I say, interning for free, right? To get the proper exposure. People like you used to say networking was key and going to events, and we haven't had events in the last two years. Is is networking and going to events still something someone can do? Yeah, I, I think I think so. Um, I've been uh, a little bit on the NFT circuit uh, in the United States. The United States, as you know, is a little bit more open uh, than uh, Canada has been. So. I, I recently spoke at um, the big NFT Los Angeles conference on digital rights and uh, and the like. Um, we uh, we were at the uh, NFT New York City conference. Uh, uh, the second one is coming up soon. Miami, 
Art Basel, a big focus of Art Basel in Miami was NFTs. And um, through these networking events, um, I've developed such incredible connections and uh, and uh, business friends, and um, we've we've had tremendous deal flow coming out of it. In fact, some uh, town strategy projects as well. So networking is not dead even after COVID. Not at all. No, networking is uh, is still very very important, and it's and it's not by any means dead. So we've talked about um, you know how to get a get a job is is. Are resumes still important? They are. Uh, I still like to see a resume. Um, Co cover letters? Uh, I would say um, a, a, a resume accompanied by a really strong customized email. So that's the that's the new cover letter. The the email to me is the new cover letter. Okay, and um, you know, people always used to want to go out and find mentors that uh, would help them get into different companies and things like that. Is that still something you recommend? If you can find a really good mentor who's who's well connected and and um, has some reasonable uh, experience and advice uh, that they can share based on their experience, I think um, I think that's a really valuable thing to have. What other advice have you got uh, for? Uh, you know, young people starting out today, um, other than, you know, don't uh, sort of chase what everyone else is doing, which you said, uh, but think about what, what you makes you uh, passionate, um, what you're passionate about. Any other advice? If you were think, standing think, up and giving a, uh, a condemn commencement speech at some university today, what would you be telling them? I, I think the keys are, uh, the, the key is being you and, 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 uh, and, and um, you know, finding that passion. But I think a corollary of that is when you're young, you shouldn't necessarily be expected to know exactly what you want to do. Um, so I would suggest to young people that they um, experiment and not be afraid to fail and not, not be afraid to actually leave a role which, which they realize quickly sometimes is not for them. But really go out there and experiment because as I say, when you're young, it's the lowest risk time in your life. Uh, you have the least amount of commitments typically when you're young and go out and explore and taste a little bit of this, taste a little bit of that and figure out where uh, your passion lies through, uh, through that kind of journey. Um, because like if you're 20 years old or 23 uh, and um, you spend five years in places that in the end aren't fulfilling to you, you, you wake up, you're 28, you're still a baby. <laughs> so you're much better off experimenting than um, sort of hitching yourself to a, to a specific ride and, and stubbornly staying there because that's the ride that you chose to go on. So somebody uh, described it this way, and I'd like to know if you agree with it or not, said that, you know, a generation ago, um, you had one job um, all, all, your, all your life. And then the next uh, sort of half generation that was maybe the 70s and 80s or 90s was that you had uh, one career with several different jobs, but that today you actually have several different careers, each of them with potentially a couple different jobs. Is that true? I think that's right. I think that's where we're headed. Um, <laughs> in a way, I've kind of evolved uh, <laughs> into that kind of thing uh, with all the various uh, companies I'm advising and my town strategy business and my philanthropic work. And I found it to be quite stimulating. And I think, I think that's kind of the, the direction that uh, young people are headed in today. And it makes for a fascinating life. Fantastic. We're chatting with uh, Joe Rosenzweig, uh, the founder of uh, Rosenzweig and Company Inc., a recruiting company, a talent uh, management, uh, talent acquisition and uh, team building company. We're going to take a final break and come back in two minutes with some concluding comments with Jay Rosenzweig. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga and Sixty. We're chatting tonight with Jay Rosenzweig, who is the founder of Rosenzweig and Company, Inc. Uh, he builds the leadership teams of tomorrow, taking responsibility for our world today. And maybe, Jay, I could uh, ask you to Say a couple of words about uh, this uh, comment that you say about uh, taking care of the world today. Uh, you um, had mentioned your uh, your involvement in global human rights. Uh, uh, you're an active board member for Erin Kotler's Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and why 
has it been so important uh, for you to have this philanthropic uh, involvement that you mentioned and, and, and particularly this involvement in, in human rights? Well, I think each of us has really a responsibility uh, to be each other's keepers. Um, and if we're in the fortunate position to be able to um, fight for the rights of those who are voiceless, um, it's, it's something that we each have the responsibility to do. So I've been inspired by the work of Erwin Kotler and uh, his hero, Raoul Wallenberg, and his clients such as uh, Nelson Mandela. And if we can each do our part, I think it's really important. I remember as a law student speaking with Professor Kotler and saying to him, you know, uh, a lot of people ask what they can really do in a world that can often feel, make us feel cynical or even indifferent. And he encouraged me to heed the words of the great sage Maimonides, who encouraged us to look at the world as if it's half good and half evil. And if you think about it in that way, then one good deed, and I tell my kids this now, whether it be helping uh, somebody to cross the street or helping their friends with homework or calling a grandparent to say hi, that one good deed can tip the scales from evil to good. Um, so in that sense, we all have, each and every one of us, a cosmic opportunity to transform the world for the better. And uh, as they say, if you save one life, it's as if you save the universe. And there's nothing more gratifying than doing good for others. Jay, one of my favorite books uh, is a book by Herman Wolf called Winds of War and War and Remembrance that was uh, a great uh, a two book series about World War II. Um, I never thought we'd ever be living through and experiencing some of that, those horrors of the, the Holocaust and, uh, and concentration camps and terror and things like that again. Um, and it appears that, you know, that might be going on in Ukraine today. Um, so talk about human rights. What do you think about what's going on in Ukraine? It's a horrific uh, situation as, as, uh, as you described. Who would have ever thought in this day and age that a country would be invaded in the middle of Europe, a sovereign country? Um, you know, there was a never again declaration after the Holocaust. And sadly, we've seen um, atrocities happen over and over again, whether it be Darfur, Rwanda, Syria, and now uh, Ukraine. Um, it's just a heartbreaking situation. Uh, I wish even more can be done. Hopefully more can be done, but it's it's like a, a timber box, as they say, right? It's, um, it's such a volatile and dangerous situation that um, the world needs to find the line that needs to be taken so that um, this, uh, this horror will be over um, in the best way possible um, uh, into the near future. But I'm just horrified by what's happening right now. I really wish that, uh, you know, never again, really truly was never again. And that, uh, you know, we had those, uh, those um, standards, those beliefs, those desires to actually step in and make sure that never again truly was never again. Anyway, it's, uh, it's people like you, um, Jay, that uh, get out there in the world. And, you know, even though you've got an incredibly busy life with your uh, recruiting business and, uh, and your investments and all these fancy things like NFTs, et cetera, that you take time out to uh, get so involved in human rights issues, I think is uh, incredibly commendable. And that's one of the things I've always noticed about you and, uh, and admired about you is that uh, you were always interested in politics. You're always interested in human rights. You're always interested in in uh, in somehow bettering um, you know our, our our position everyone's position in uh, in life, and so thank you for that. And I've always been inspired by uh, your uh, unbelievably diverse interest in so many different things. And uh, and I knew you were involved in uh, in some things, but never heard about the NFTs uh, before today. And so that's uh, fascinating that you're so involved in in uh, in such a, a cutting edge uh, technology and 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 new segment of, of industrial society, uh, uh, if I can call it that. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. Jay Rosenzweig of Rosenzweig. Uh, if uh, people want to uh, you know, check you out, maybe uh, check out your, uh, your studies on, uh, on equality, is there a website that uh, they can go to? Yes, I think the best website would be my personal website, which uh, encompasses a lot of my work. Um, so it would literally be my name.com. So J-A-Y Rosenzweig.com. 
no dots or anything uh, in between, just jrosenswag.com. Thanks so much for joining us. That's our show for today, everybody. I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Thanks for joining us, everyone else. Good night.